Good afternoon. Welcome to today's program, Resilience and the Human Spirit, Addressing Trauma and PTSD in Recovery. I'm Julie Miller, Editor-in-Chief of Addiction Professional. Today's program is a Foundation's Recovery Network webinar sponsored by Millennium Health. Thank you to our sponsor and to everyone in our audience for giving us your time and attention today. And before we get started, we do have a few details to share with you. You'll notice that each window on your screen can be moved by clicking and dragging, or you can enlarge and minimize by clicking on the icons in the top right corner of each window. Also, please use the Q&A area to the right of the slides to submit a question at any time. You don't have to wait until the end of the presentation. But if you can't see this area, just click on the red Q&A button. To download a copy of today's presentation, please click the link in the resources area in the lower left of your screen. And if you have any technical issues during the program, uh, please click the yellow help button and we will definitely help you troubleshoot the issue. And we have a special note about CE credit today. To receive credit for today's program, you must click on the green CE certificate at the conclusion of the program and complete the evaluation form. If you're watching today's program in a group, please download the group submission guide and program evaluation form located in today's resources list and follow the instructions. If you have any issues with this process, uh, please do not reach out to today's sponsor. They will not be able to assist you in receiving your certificate. And please note, CE credit is not available for the archived webinar. It is only available for the live event today. And finally, you can also tweet during today's webinar by clicking on the blue Twitter icon at the bottom of your screen. Simply click the Post and Authorize buttons to log into your Twitter account and begin sharing automatically at the event hashtag APLiveWebinar. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Judy Crane. Judy Crane has over two decades of experience working in both residential and outpatient settings. In 2003, she founded The Refuge, a healing place, leveraging her years of specialized training and insights on treating trauma and addiction. Judy's training, experiential methods, and holistic concepts are now offered through a profound five-module program called Spirit to Spirit, Trauma Training and Treatment. Thank you so much, Judy, for taking the time to speak with us today. And with that, I will turn the audience over to you. Thank you so much, Julie. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. And to my audience, thank you. Um, this is uh, always a, uh, an interesting opportunity for me, uh, for you not to see me and for me not to see you. You know, I'm a therapist to my core, and so working with folks, I really need to see their eyes. So this is a little challenging, and, and, um, and I am uh, hoping that you'll get the, the energy that this this particular topic gives me. I've been doing this kind of work for really a long time. I recognized a long time ago that um, that with addiction of any sort, process addiction, sub addiction, that when relapse happens, um, there's usually something else going on. And uh, my experience has shown me that that there are trauma, that it's the core issues of a of a of the soul wound that are creating the necessity for relapse for a human being. Um, I like to think that there are um, just a couple of choices that an addict in recovery has in early recovery. Uh, when issues come up, that emotional experience that's coming up that, that envelops all of us, um, what we can do if it's overwhelming us is that we can allow ourselves to go crazy, we can commit suicide, or we can relapse. And at that point, relapse is the sanest option where we can do this trauma work. My, the purpose of this particular uh, PowerPoint is to be able to offer the opportunity for us to look at our clients with different eyes, with, with a trauma lens, being able to see how trauma has created for many, many, many folks a, a level of resilience that um, has helped them to survive. And that level of resilience has also cre created 
what looks to some people like pretty crazy behaviors. Um, I'm in recovery a long time, and I know that my behaviors in my addiction were rather bizarre. I think part of why I've been able to be so resilient is because of my life experiences, because of the things that I survived and the coping mechanisms that I had to create to deal with that. And so well, I want to look at, at what it is about about trauma survivors and recovering people that uh, enables us to to really be resilient and what those elements are. So um, let's move on. Um, this is something I really love by Steve Jobs. Um, here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round heads and the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. The only thing you can't do is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward and while some see them as the crazy ones, we see genius because they are the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world and they are the ones who do. And we are the ones that um, manage to create a bong out of a banana if we need to. Uh, we're the ones that can come up with solutions that no one else thinks of, that creativity that is is um, developed as a result of, of some of that innate brain chemistry, but it's also developed as a result of, of um, the necessities for survival. And trauma coping mechanisms are all about, trauma, uh, about survival. So um, I hope you agree with me. I know that... Most addicts I know are um, extraordinarily creative and talented and really bright. And when we get sober, amazing things happen. Uh, Jack Kerouac said on the road, the only people for me are the mad ones, the ones who are mad to live, mad to talk, mad to be saved. And as people would come to the doors of the refuge, what I would see were people who, even though they might have been in treatment many times, continued to come back because there was this spark of hope that maybe this time, that maybe this time I would find a secret and a miracle that would happen. And, um, and so these mad ones that come to our doors, the mad ones that we're working with, these clients who are so extraordinary and who have done such extraordinary things in their life that are survival, that these are the folks that we're working with. And so I want us to be able to look at these folks with different lenses. When we can do that, we can help our clients find joy, and then they can create brilliant and shiny lives, brilliant and shiny brains, brilliant and shiny hearts, mad to be saved. I know that, I know that when, um, when folks come um, to treatment, uh, when folks are, are, are brought into this world, when babies are born, that they're shiny. They're shiny and they're bright and things haven't happened to them yet to tarnish their spirits or their souls. And that's what I want us to get to. Those folks, that part of those people that were shiny when they were born and that can continue to be shiny and that we can help to polish the, the tarnished uh, spirits that they've, they've gotten. So we're looking at the crazy ones. Trauma is the breeding ground for the survivors of all stripes and behaviors. They're often described as extraordinarily bright, creative, maddening, extraordinarily driven, and, and talented in a multitude of ways. Um, they're sensitive, well beyond the norm, vigilant and aware of all, all around them, uh, astute in, in reading other people and dangerous situations, surviving by our wit and learned behaviors that have given relief from overwhelming angst and pain. Certainly in the midst of this active addiction and supposed psychiatric diagnosis or PTSD, it takes cleverness and great talent to maintain the insanity. And how many of us among us keep walking, waking, excuse me, waiting to be found out, um, believing that we are faking it, that others have the secret of living in their own skin and we are seeking the key to the mystery of life. If any of you have heard me at conferences, you'll know that one of the first things I do when I'm standing on stage 
is to tell you how anxious and nervous I am, just like I am now, and that my voice quivers and I get um, uh, concerned and worried that you're going to find out exactly that, that you're going to find out that I'm a fraud and that I'm faking it and I don't know what I'm talking about. And then if I take a breath and I relax and can allow myself to know the truth, the truth is that I do know what I'm talking about, that we know what we're talking about. And so many of us in this audience have often felt that same way, um, that we have felt that we were frauds and that somebody is going to find us out. I suspect you have felt that way, many of you. Um, but the truth is we really do know what we're doing. And that feeling of being a fraud, of waiting to be found out, is such a tra- uh, trauma mechanism, such a coping mechanism. What I want you to do is I want you to look at these babies, these wonderful, amazing babies. Look at their eyes and look at the joy that they're experiencing when we're brought into this world. That's the truth about who we are. That's the truth about what we're experiencing. We're experiencing life in absolutely the moment. That Everything that happens to us is new and beautiful and exciting and just awe-inspiring. I don't know about you, but I love watching the babies, the laughing babies on YouTube. I just love, I love seeing these babies that are singing and just letting life explode from them. So I'm asking you that when you're working with clients, that probably the most powerful thing that you can do when you're working with anyone is to be able to find that space in them, that place where that little baby lives, where that child lives, where that joy and wonder lives. Because this is the truth. Joy, wonder, and delight. Most children, even those with early childhood trauma, experience joy, wonder, delight, curiosity. So what creates resilience in these little ones as they grow into trauma survivors? What makes it possible for us to survive, for us to be able to grow and develop and become resilient human beings, able to survive the most incredible things. If you're a trauma therapist like me, you've heard some stories that uh, probably have broken your heart. I know I have. And I know that every client that I work with in front of me, there's a, a, a possibility of tapping into that resilient child and describing to them what that resilience looks like and asking the simple question, How did you survive that? How did you survive those horrendous events? Help us to tap into that because that's the part of that human being sitting in front of you that can get well, that can get better, that can recover, that can stop relapsing, that can process and uh, resolve the trauma that they've experienced in their life. Not forget it because you won't forget it but it'll have less of of power over our clients. And in the middle of all that, they'll see the power of the experience of trauma and how that's added to their ability to be resilient. So when we talk about the road to resilience, this is from the American Psychological Association, um, the factors in resilience. Developing resilience is a personal journey. Some variations may reflect cultural differences life experience, the level and quality of or lack of support systems. The primary predictor of levels of resilience are relationships that create love and trust, provide role models, and offer encouragement, reassurance, and solace. Several studies by the AP have bolstered the understanding of these these factors. Over and over again, what I understand from my clients is how important those relationships, those warm and loving relationships, those relationships that um, that came in to our lives at a time when we were most vulnerable, that those relationships that lift us up and tell us that we are special, that we have something important, those are the relationships that save us. And over and over again, I see those things happen. I know they happen for me. Those angels that came into my life that helped me to survive, and I suspect that they happen for you. 
and later we'll look at what that resilience might look like. So factors that create resilience, making connections. What what I know is I want you, I would like you to look at, uh, at two levels of this, how our clients have made connections in the past and what your role as clinician may be in helping them to create resilience or to strengthen that resilience or expand that resilience. So we're looking at two things, what was and what can be. So making connections. Who are those people in, in our clients' lives who help to support them and give them a place of safety? Um, and how can you increase that level of secure attachment or help create secure attachment? We're talking about dyadic attachment, what that looks like. The role of a client is, I mean, excuse me, the role of a therapist is to help create that, that, um, that place that can fertilize resilience, fertilize uh, secure attachment. Uh, we can help our clients to avoid seeing crises as each and animal problems by changing the perception. If a client comes to you like I've had this week that says that everything in his life is falling apart and that there's so much injustice and there can't be justice in this world and, um, and, and that if anything could go wrong, it would go wrong. The ability to be able to help that client get to a place where we can help change the perception. And we do that in many simple ways. One of the ways is, is to be able to create a, a list or a collage of all, all the sources that help to save their, our clients, that help them to create some resilience. One of the things for this client of mine was his uh, relationship with animals. And when he could really attach to that, that there was resilience there that he'd had for a long time, that was an important step for him. Uh, except that change is part of living. The best example I have seen of that recently is is Noah, um, one of our one of our soldiers uh, who was on Dancing with the Stars. I hope you saw it. It was just so exhilarating and so um, awe inspiring. And uh, Noah had lost um, a leg and an arm, and as a dancer, he just was so extraordinary that he would be able to make dance look like something anyone could do. And he did. And he did. And to be able to do that, accept the change as part of living, and be able to show what that change might look like. I suspect that if he hadn't lost any of his limbs, he may not have ever danced. But he did lose his limbs and he did dance. Move towards your goals. Um, accomplish one thing, and I, I invite my clients to do that. One new thing a day. One simple thing a day. One day at a time. And what would that look like if I could do one thing different? One day at a time. Um, take decisive action. And by that I mean act and not react. Most of us who have been trauma survivors have a tendency to react. Um, and our job is to be able to help our clients to stop, think, feel through a feeling, and get to the place where it becomes taking action instead of reacting. Opportunities for self-discovery, uh, having been able to develop new strengths from events, nurture a positive view, it's the most important thing we can do with our clients is to help them to move from a negative self-view to a very positive self-view. And that's certainly why we do affirmations. Uh, perspective, also an incredibly important thing to do because if we can help someone change their perspective, we can change their life. Cre help to create a help hopeful outlook. Again, um, a client this week who said, no, I'll never be able to have a relationship again, coming to the conclusion that Maybe that way really was possible. And, and for us to be able to do that with the work that we do, various exercises that we do to make it make us see that it's possible that it can happen. Self-care, which I would like to say that for clinicians, we need to do all of these things for ourselves as well and ultimately work toward trauma resolution. And as clinicians, we need to do that as well. So I invite all of you to do your work to know that there's more work and there's always more work. 
and that uh, each time you do a piece of work, it gets better. So we're talking about a matter of attachment, and that's what we have with our clients, that ability to have uh, an example of what healthy attachment looks like. So we're dyadic attachment, providing the opportunity to create or recreate an environment for healthy social engagement. A warm, compassionate, empathetic role model to assist in the opportunity to develop new social skills. AI was way ahead of us in this. They were already doing that with sponsorship. A relationship that engenders trust that will lead to a wider community of trust and acceptance. Again, starts with a sponsor, ends up being able to trust the whole community. A cheerleader, a cheerleader to encourage an experience of positive self-regard. A mentor to guide the process. So I know that we can help to change someone's experience of what attachment looks like and help them to develop secure and healthy attachment. We have that ability. Now, I don't know how many of you have been in an audience with me lately, but this is my favorite slide. And if you're with a group of people, I just invite you to think of the possibility of getting up and giving a hug, just a 30-second hug. And when you do that, just be able to melt into one another, be able to breathe in time with one another, and know that oxytocin is being released. And oxytocin is what is released when a woman uh, breastfeeds. It's the love drug. And you can, you can help to release oxytocin in your own body and someone else's in just 30 seconds. Being able to breathe, breathe out the bad, breathe in the good, breathe out the pain, breathe in the love. Um, I hope some of you are doing it out there. If you come to my audio, if you come to one of my conferences, chances are I'm going to ask you to do that. Um, I'm teaching our clients how to do that. There is a dearth of and, and a lack of of uh, physical touch among people today. And uh, we need physical touch. We absolutely need physical touch or we can't be healthy. So I would ask you to do your part in physically hugging folks. What's interesting is I see in my audiences how difficult it is for some of the therapists. I want you to see what that might mean and be able to uh, make yourself avail available to another human being. So... I love the kind of hugs where you can physically feel the sadness leaving your body. Can you feel that? Can you experience that with your clients? Can you see that happen for them? I'd like to talk about suicide and resilience and what that means. Um, there have been a lot of studies around suicide and resilience, and I think it's really important for us to recognize that. Um, there have been... Um, enormous numbers of, of drug-related suicides and trauma-related suicides. Uh, it, certainly in, in the uh, addiction community, the recovery community uh, across the country that I've been involved in. And um, I know that our heroin is, is, uh, is much more powerful, but we're talking about suicide of people who haven't resolved their trauma issues, and so um, suicide becomes an option. Suicide is the tenth leading cause of death in the U.S. for all ages, and that's from the CDC. Homicide ranks 16. Suicide ranks 10. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for 15 to 24-year-olds. That's just horrifying, isn't it? After a decrease in suicides from 1990 to 2000, from 12.5 suicides per 100,000 to 10.4 per 100,000, the rate of suicides has increased to 12.1 per 100,000. Every day, approximately 105 Americans die by suicide. Um, I, I think it's probably more than that. I think unreported suicides are there. Uh, depression affects 20 to 25% of Americans 18 and older in a given year. Suicide takes the, the death of over 38,000 Americans every year. Only half of all Americans experiencing an episode of major depression receive treatment. Only half. And 80 to 90% of people treated for depression are treated successfully using therapy 
and and or medication. So if we were able to treat our our folks, we would be able to cut down on suicide. And this is from the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. A body of research indicates that there is a correlation between many types of trauma and suicidal behavior. For example, there is evidence that traumatic events such as childhood abuse may increase a person's suicide risk. A history of military sexual trauma um, also increases the risk for suicide and intentional self-harm. It is suggested that those uh, that have experienced multiple sexual traumas and or multiple combat-related wounds and hospitalizations are more likely to be at risk for, uh, for suicide attempts. A history of suicide in a family is also a risk for other family members, often due to survivor's guilt and remorse. Just as troubling the trauma of exposure to suicide, suicide ideation, threats or attempts creates additional risk of acting out due to PTSD. I know that we have been dealing with a lot of um, veterans and so many of these veterans had attempted suicide and called the VA um, to get some help. But unfortunately, there's such um, uh, such few resources that one of the one of our um, one of our vets came in and she told them she was suicidal, and they told her that there would be a year before she could get a uh, an appointment. I mean, my God, how sad is that? That is just horrible and, and sad. And um, and what can we do to help that? When we talk about moral injury, suicide, and the soul wound, moral injury is when when we um, do something that is beyond our own moral um, and ethical and spiritual boundaries. So that when we do a fourth step, for instance, in a 12-step program, what we're doing is we're talking about those horrible things that we did in our addiction that we were capable of um, when we were under the influence. And I don't know about you, but in my addiction, I was capable of anything under the influence. And when I did my fourth step, it was just um, overwhelmed by the things that I had done that I never thought in my life that I would be able to do. And those things really eat at your soul wound. When we have young people who are sexually abused, more often than not, they take on that, that shame and that guilt and they believe that they're responsible. Um, I've had clients tell us the blood, it won't come off. It won't come off. And they can't wash their hands enough for the blood to come off. Um, one of our clients, when uh, when she was a little girl, she was five, she was sexually molested by someone in the church. And she came from a very large family. And this man had threatened that if she didn't, if she didn't come every day to the bathroom, the restroom, and and let him do what he needed to do, then he would hurt her sisters. She couldn't let that happen. So every day she would go and be there and um, and and he would sexually abuse her. Later on during treatment and during a session of um, traumatic experience and EMDR together, what, she just, what we heard was that he would tell her every day that she had bad blood, that she had bad blood, that this was her fault, and, um, and she was responsible for what was happening. The reason this client was sent to us was because she was bloodletting. She would get a syringe, and she would let blood. And she did that for a long period of time. She had no idea why she did it. She just knew that when she did, she got relief. And so that revelation under somatic experience in EMDR was extraordinary. It was a huge event for her to be able to understand why she was doing what she was doing. What I tell people all the time is behaviors always, always, always make sense when you can unravel the trauma story. And her behavior made absolute sense when you could unravel the trauma story. Not only did it make sense to us, it made sense to her, and she stopped bloodletting. It was a powerful piece of work to be done. Um, Veterans have come to us, and I've done some work with with them, and um, one of the things that a captain said to me not long ago, when he was talking about his responsibility in um, 
in having 400 troopers and what it was like for them to to do things that they never thought they would do in their lives. And he said to me, you know, we had to go out there and um, and attack these folks from the from the village because the the men were part of the Taliban, and uh, but we had to count shoes to count the dead because there was nothing left except their shoes. And what that did to that man's soul, what that did to his his feelings about um, his performance as a soldier, the confusion of of the incongruency of wanting to to honor his his country and yet at the same time not honor his God. It was a horrible place for him to be. And PTSD just overwhelmed him um, 10 years after being there. So as most of you know, trauma isn't just a today thing. It's with us all the time. And sometimes it doesn't come to to our, our site for many years later that we don't have that memory of it and all of a sudden the memory comes up because of some circumstances. And finally, that last statement, it was my fault. I didn't pull him out of the pool in time. For a young boy who didn't pull his brother out of the pool in time before he drowned, and we're talking about a five-year-old boy feeling responsible for his three-year-old brother to dying and drowning. But this is the result. This is the final result. Of, of how this moral injury can be turned around. Um, we had a young man um, at the refuge, a wonderful, wonderful young man who had been sexually molested as a child. And um, he, he um, became suicidal. There were a lot of other things that happened to him, layers and layers of trauma. And he became suicidal as a, an adolescent. He attempted suicide a few times and, and had a very terrified parents. He'd been in and out of treatment um, as a result of the addiction that went with it. The the pain around um, around being molested just was overwhelming to him. So at the refuge, he came to us just before a suicide attempt, and I mean, excuse me, just after a suicide attempt. And so staff was alert. And so this young man was working with a couple of really good therapists um, who, you know, helped him through the suicidality. And what he started to do was to self-harm, and he started to cut. The staff managed to get rather upset and, um, and worried because they were afraid for him. Um, but most of the staff understood what was going on, that he was just getting, he was getting some relief from not cutting, I mean, from cutting as opposed to attempting suicide. So in reality, he was making progress by cutting. I know that sounds a little insane, but remember what we're dealing with. So we managed to keep that young man. He graduated, and um, he went with his father um, to Saipan. And his father uh, was a wonderful man who works in ecology and, and reefs, and his biggest goal was that he wanted to work with his dad. He started... Uh, diving with his dad, and he would send home, he would send pictures to us all the time of the places where he was and what he was doing. And what was extraordinary was he sent this back. So today I went to Suicide Cliff. It's a place where 5,000 Japanese soldiers jumped to their death when the American forces took the island. As I looked over the cliff's edge, I didn't get the urge to jump. I stood back, and I looked at the view my dad was talking about, and I started to cry. It's hard to imagine I would have missed the view of my life if I had died those few months ago. Yesterday, we bought a tuna fish fresh off a boat and cut it up ourselves. I dive every day. I've seen turtles and sharks and octopuses so much more. Thank you, Tom and Janina. It's a good day to be live today. And that's what we do. When we can stand um, shoulder to shoulder with our clients, and we can be there with them, and we can help them walk through this terrible place. We can help them get from that place of, of suicidality to a place of, of resilience. And this young man has just, he is the epitome of what it, look, it looks like to be able to build resilience. And um, 
I don't think we'll ever have to worry about him even thinking about suicide again. When I started this particular PowerPoint, I was on vacation in Aruba, and Robin Williams had passed. He had committed suicide. And, I, and so, the, you know, that particular event really drove me to this particular PowerPoint. And I want you to think about all these characters that he was able to play, the genius, the skills, the insanity of his mind and what that looked like. What an amazing man. What a tortured man. And... Uh, the wonderful part of having him in our lives and being able to know that uh, that he did the very best he can to be resilient. I'm going to jump a, a, ahead a few slides here. I, I apparently have been talking a lot, and you'll bear with me. You can read this at another time, but we're talking about the soul wound and what that means for us to be able to offer hope and describe our clients as courageous when the most overriding drive they have is uh, for relief in all of the many forms. And uh, if you can read that later, I think that would be very helpful to you. This is a slide about what we call Ubuntu. Well, we don't, but the, the Sosha culture, it means I am because we are. And I'm hoping that our industry will be able to come to this place. An anthropologist proposed a game to the kids in an African tribe he put a basket of fruit near a tree and told them that whoever got there first was, uh, won the sweet fruits. When he gave them the signal to run, they all took each other's hands and ran together, then sat in a circle enjoying their treats. When he asked them why they chose to run as a group, when they could have had more fruit individually, one child spoke up and said, Ubuntu, how can one of us be happy if all the other ones are sad? You know, and I want you to... Uh, to know that I honor and respect all of you who come into this business and do this work because I think that this is at the core of your soul. Just quickly, trauma is a P. Melody's definition. Anything that's less than nurturing, I think that's, that's good. Um, I, I also believe trauma is any event or situation that changes your vision of yourself and your place in the world in a negative way. Resilience is built when any life event or situation changes you and your vision of yourself in the world in a positive way. So those are the various traumas. You can look at those. Okay. There's lot, there are a lot of things on there that people don't recognize as traumas. And I really think it would be very powerful for you to look at that list because there's so many things. Um, adoption, in vitro uh, fertilization, um, uh, you know, fires, uh, divorce, uh, financial issues, whether you have too much or you have too little. And then I ask you to make a list here of all the things, all the ways in which you've been resilient, resilient in your life. What, what events have created resilience in your life? What situations, events, people? And I invite you to make that list. Um, and those are the signs and symptoms of trauma. I'm sorry, I need to get ahead. This is a wonderful slide. I would like to, um, if, if you can go to this website, Soul Park has a great website about the neurobiology of the brain. And this is a really simple way to understand neuroplasticity. And the importance of neuroplasticity is this is how we change our clients, help our clients to change the way they're thinking and be able to create new neuropathways. And when we do those new neuropathways, they start to be able to have, have um, positive brain chemistry instead of the negative brain chemistry that's been there. So I want to thank my team for helping me to do this. So making brain science simple. When you look at this and you look at the blue arrow going to the red arrow, that's an old negative message that's been entrenched and, uh, and has created a, a pathway so that every day that I say, oh, you're so stupid, Judy, you're so stupid, you're not, you're not smart, you're you're big and you're ugly too. Um, every day that I say that to myself, the multiple times a day, I'm creating that negative neural pathway. And, and we know that we do that, and our clients certainly do that in a much bigger way. But if we start to change the neural pathway, it is so simple. We take our blue arrow and we, and we start with a new message. 
a positive message that goes down to the green arrow. And the green arrow gets longer, more entrenched, and it becomes that new positive message. And if you've read Maxwell Maltz in um, Psycho-Cybernetics, 21 days, it takes 21 days to change, to change the brain chemistry. But we have to be able to help our clients and ourselves to understand what that means to take 21 days of constantly changing the message. Um, I hope you can do that for your clients. I know it's been powerful for our clients. Use good pathways more often to get a life you love. And I love this because I know that it's true. Um, I think people are hopeful that their lives get better, but people never change because they are under threat or under duress, never. They change because they see something that makes their life seem valuable enough to start moving toward a life worth living. And when we can help our clients to find purpose in their life, that's a powerful message. So many of us get clean and sober, and the purpose in our life becomes helping other people to get clean and sober, helping other people walk through their trauma, helping other people to create a new life for themselves. I love uh, I love that this happened for Robert Downey Jr. because prison and jail didn't help him, but but a woman on his on his uh, his movie set who said to him, Robert, you have something extraordinary to give the world, made a difference for him, and he ended up marrying her. When I talk about outcomes on Facebook, that's me being able to go on Facebook and look and see these clients, these most impossible clients who have changed their lives, who have changed the message, changed, changed from trauma victims to survivors, and then finally to resilient thrivers. And that's what they are. And on, on Facebook, I see it all the time. Clients who are going back to school, our alumni who have been married, who are having babies because now they know how to be a parent. They didn't know how to be a parent because they weren't parented. But now they know. And to be able to see what... Uh, what um, Facebook can show us about, about alumni, those are the best demographics for me. This is just some more of our research. Deep disclosure improves mood, uh, objective and subjective health, and the ability to function well. And this is from the American Psychological Association. Essentially saying that, that being able to talk about what happened to us that it makes a huge difference. And they're talking about a study among Holocaust survivors that that um, uh, a third of them went deep, a third of them went not so deep, and, uh, and another third went not deep at all. And the ones who got the biggest benefit, the biggest health benefit out of, out of deep disclosure were the ones that went the deepest. And that's what uh, we, I mean, that's certainly what, what I do with my clients, but it's what we do at the refuge because it's very important and powerful. So I want to show you what that looks like. What we're doing is we're rewriting the story. And in this case, this is a story from a Russian boy who was adopted and, uh, and was having great difficulty getting sober because he hated his mother and he hated his, his adopted mother. And, and when I asked him about that, he said, um, I never had a relationship with my mother. And I said, certainly you did, a nine-month relationship. And he created this beautiful body map an in utero body map, I asked him to write the story that he needed to believe about his mother, his biological mother, and he did. And it's beautiful and it's stunning. And he talked about how she loved music and how she loved art and how it pained her heart and broke her heart that she had to give him up and, and uh, that he knew she loved him and tried to do the best for him. And it was a magnificent piece that helped him get to the other side. So in, in the follow-up, um, that was the Holocaust survivor, so you can read that as well. Um, but we're going to rewrite the story again. And this is one of our clients who also did a body map, but this is a body map of, of how frenetic her life was. And um, she had not just a busy brain, but she had a busy body. And all the traumas in her life are reflected there because these are all the addictions, the process addictions, the substance addictions, um, all the insanity that was going on in her brain and her ability to finally rewrite the story because this is what she was living with. This, this vision is what she had of herself and what she was living with. Uh, so we focus on the powerful, euphoric, magical, synchronistic 
beautiful parts of life and the universe will keep giving them to you. I believe that with all my heart. And we rewrite the story. I'll tell you this story and then we'll just have a couple of minutes. Um, One of the gentlemen in town um, came to an intensive of ours. Every one of his family members had been to an intensive and they were saying that he needed to come. He was the father. And um, his son was murdered in a drug deal gone bad. And um, his girlfriend was murdered. And they knew that um, they knew that uh, there was somebody from town who did it and who wasn't coming clean. Um, and so he came to he came to the intensive. Everybody else had done the work around this, but I asked him what did he want to have happen by the end of the week, and he said, "I want to get up off the sofa. I've been on the sofa for ten years. I have not done any of the things that I've done in my life. I've been on the sofa for ten years." So I know that you can't do this in most treatment centers or certainly not in a private practice, but his group invited him to burn the sofa, and he did. He did. In order to get up off the sofa, he burnt it. And um, it was an incredible experience for his group, for his family who was there to experience it, and for him. And uh, what a great, what a great uh, intervention, yeah? cells in your body react to everything that your mind says. Negativity brings down your immune system. I know that that's true because I know that folks who come to us with so many um, illnesses and we call them somatic not because they're not real but because they're created by by trauma and when they do the trauma work, those, those illnesses have a tendency to go away. Um, we're doing pretty good here. Cells in your body react to everything positive that your mind says. Positivity insists in our clients to be aware of and focus on the strengths and resilience that they have. Heals and creates a visceral cellular facelift. The brain chemistry changes. New neural pathways are created. Perceptions change. Lives are saved. And our clients find purpose where there was none. And the ripple effect of that healing is enormous. And if we do it right, the family experiences that as well. This is a resilience wheel, and you can go to this particular website as well from Nan Henderson, and she has got a whole um, um, instrument that you can use to um, identify levels of resilience for your clients, and you might want to look at what that might look like for you. So we clinicians create programs that develop resilience. We create dyadic attachment and reparent and mentor our clients to become people of purpose and resilience beyond the survival paradigm, which is so exhausting and all-consuming. Our job is to provide the opportunity and the direction for our clients to experience or re-experience joy, connection, love, healthy attachment, community, and purpose. And when we, when we do, our clients heal. We first must do this for ourselves. And if you know me, you know that that's my biggest mantra, um, that we have to do this work for ourselves. We have to do this work for ourselves. So here's to the crazy ones. And I'd like you to read that again for yourself. This is what I believe about our clients. Your weirdness will make you stronger. Your dark side will keep you whole. Your vulnerability will connect you to the rest of the suffering world. Your creativity will set you free. There's nothing wrong with you. And I suspect in this audience there are a lot of folks here um, who have rewritten their own stories. That if you're like me, then you you had some weirdness and a dark side and vulnerable. And being able to use those pieces of ourselves, that sensitive part of ourselves, that make us really, really good at what we do. You know, I applaud all that you do. Um, You are the most amazing people in the world. It's exciting to be able to have the opportunity to work with you, and I hope I see you out on the road. Thank you so much. I had a lovely day with you all. Judy, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. That was a great presentation. Uh, Before we get into the Q&A portion of today's event, uh, I would like to hand things over to Melanie Melcher from Foundations for a few words from our sponsor. Thanks, Julie. 
Here at Foundations Recovery Network, our grassroots movement called Heroes in Recovery has a simple mission, to eliminate the social stigma that keeps addicted individuals from seeking help, to share stories of recovery for the purpose of encouragement and inspiration, and to create an engaged, sober community that empowers people to get involved, give back, and live healthy, active lives. Join us in this mission at our 6K race series at these locations across the country. As a thank you for your attendance today, please enjoy the discount code WEBINAR2015 to register for any future 6K event. Back to you, Julie. Thanks so much, Melanie. We've already had a number of really good questions come in from the audience, but we'd like to remind everyone that you can use the Q&A widget below the slides on your screen to submit a question at any time. So, Judy, are you ready? We have quite a few. We'll take maybe a minute or two for each and see how many we can get through. Someone in our audience asks, um, as a person in long-term sobriety and coming from a history of trauma, how do you suggest maintaining a balance between helping others move through their trauma and maintaining your own recovery? I think the most important thing in, in, in that arena is that you have got to do your own work, and I'm not being, uh, I'm not being a wise mouth. But doing your own work is not just a fourth step, and I, I, I'm not diminishing the fourth step. I've done a few myself. But it, it, it's really important to come in and do your own deep, deep trauma work, and that's the thing that helps you be able to balance both of those worlds because it is, it is, it is a difficult balancing act. And if you don't take care of yourself in that arena, you're going to get in trouble, and I unfortunately have seen that happen. Okay, great. Um, and do you have any suggestions on how to supervise counselors who have no experience with trauma? <laughs> Send them for training. Um, it, it, well, the training for trauma is, I mean, it, there is a lot to know about trauma. You know, over and above the modalities that we use, like EMDR and somatic experience, hypnosis and psychodrama and all of those other things, it's really important to be able to understand um, how trauma and our coping mechanisms are so tightly interconnected that we need, we need to be able to know and identify um, the various um, ways in which people relapse. It could, I mean, it, we're looking at people who, when we take away their alcohol and drugs, when they get clean and sober from those things, then the next thing that pops up more often than not, if it's not there, is sex addiction and eating disorders and um, self-harming behaviors because when we take away the primary uh, coping mechanism, something else has to happen unless, unless we give our clients um, another way to deal with it. So if, if a new therapist or therapists who haven't worked with trauma don't know these things or haven't experienced them or don't know what they look like, they, it, oftentimes it, it, it's an overwhelming place. And unfortunately, without really good training, we can do damage. And, and we've, you know, I've seen a lot of that that happens. Um, for instance, just, just a client saying to me, nobody ever asked me that question before. Now, if somebody's on... As an example, um, a client who is on Adderall and has been on Adderall for years because they were um, diagnosed with ADHD, there's a simple question I asked this man who was in his 30s who did not want to get off the Adderall and was certain that he was ADHD, and gee, what was his drug of choice? Crystal meth. Um, and I said to him, what, why did they prescribe Adderall? He said, they sent me to a doctor. I said, why? He said, because I was acting out and I was, I was angry all the time and I couldn't sit still and, um, and I was getting in a lot of fights. And, um, and so they gave me Adderall. And I said, can you tell me what happened to you when you were seven? Because that's when you started the doctor. And he said, I was sexually abused by a camp counselor. He had never told anyone that. And nobody ever asked him what happened to you at seven that you needed to be put on Adderall? Now, that shouldn't be, um, you know, a difficult segue for a therapist. 
or to be able to look at someone who's been on meds or who went to a psychiatrist when they were a child and ask that simple question because most children really truly are not acting out for no reason. It's very rare when a child is acting out for no reason. Oftentimes there's a divorce going on at home or or there's something going on in the home that, you know, maybe some infidelity that the child knows and and the other parent doesn't know. There's usually something going on that that has this opportunity for a child to act out. Well, there are a, a myriad of places and and situations where if you don't if you haven't thought about it, you're not going to ask those questions. And those questions are the things that lead us to where the trauma sits. I hope that makes sense. Um, uh, it it does, and thank you so much for your thoughtful response to that. Thank you. I, I just um, I, I my goal when I started training client uh, therapist was not because I I needed or wanted to make money around it. That's not it at all, and I and we don't. But what I wanted, what I needed was to, for us to be able to have really good trauma therapists to send our clients back to when they went home. And there just were not a lot of real trauma therapists. Um, in any case, I, you know, I hope that was helpful and I, and I hope that you will reach out for it. Because what I know also is that a two or three day trauma training is really not adequate. And that's not to, judge anybody else's program. I just know that there's so much involved in what we're dealing with when we're dealing with trauma survivors. And if you're dealing with addiction, you are dealing probably with 85 to 90% trauma survivors. I don't really know any addicts who haven't uh, experienced trauma. Okay, and uh, we have a question from an audience member that's actually about a very big issue. So maybe uh, you could just give us one quick tip uh, can you talk about shame as it relates to trauma and addiction treatment? Maybe okay. one quick tip for the audience. That that's the overriding that's the overriding feeling that trauma survivors have is shame, and whether whether it was done to them or whether they did it, it, it that's it. None of that matters. It's the it's that uh, the energy around betrayal and mistrust and. Um, uh, being used, whatever the traumas are, um, we, we lose some really important part of ourselves. We lose some aspect of our innocence or of our dreams when when trauma happens to us, whether it's divorce or whatever it is. But um, dealing with shame is um, it, it's you know it, it's one of the most important things we do uh, because unless we can help our clients to let go of shame, they they can't get through the resolution. One of the things I do is, especially if it's childhood trauma, um, I try to bring out pictures of children, the ages of when our clients might have or supposedly experienced their trauma. And I can't tell you how often it takes somebody's breath away when they realize that this shame they've been experiencing. Um, they see a, a five or six or seven-year-old child or a 10-year-old child and they realize that there's no way that, that child should be experiencing shame, no matter what was done, no matter what they did or or what was done to them. That's not their shame to bear, and and it's um, I mean it's a really powerful message. Not Absolutely, an easy message, and I know it's, it's a huge message. no. No, and certainly a, a huge topic. Um, well, I know we could talk about this all day, but unfortunately that is all the time that we do have for questions. Uh, we have some final instructions, though, regarding CE credit. And again, should you have any issues with this process, please do not reach out to today's sponsor. Uh, they actually won't be able to assist you in re receiving your certificate. The e-learning systems has approved today's program for one continuing education credit. To receive your certificate of completion, you must click the green CE Certificate Widget, complete the evaluation form, and click Submit. For those of you watching in a group, as a reminder, please download the Group Submission Guide and Program Evaluation located in the Resources area and follow the instructions provided. If you're watching from a mobile device or tablet, you will need to email the Help Desk to receive a program evaluation and certificate for this program. Please note again that CE credit is not available for the archived webinar. It's only available for today's live event. If you have any questions, 
please click on the purple Contact Webinar Help Desk widget at the bottom of the screen. And also, please join us on Wednesday, June 24, 2015, at 1 o'clock Eastern Time for another Addiction Professional Webinar sponsored by Foundations Recovery Network along with Millennium Health. It's titled, Pharmacogenetics and Addiction, How to Have More Direct Medications. It's presented by Kenneth Kirsch, Ph.D. A link will appear on your screen in a moment for you to register for the program. You can also register for the event by clicking on the Register for the next AP Webinar sponsored by Foundation widget at the bottom right of the screen. And I want to thank Judy Crane once again for an excellent presentation, and I would also like to thank Millennium Health for making today's Foundation's Recovery Network program possible. And finally, thank you to everyone in our audience for participating today. We do hope you'll join us again in the future for another Addiction Professional Webinar. This concludes today's presentation.